The talk is going to be uh, fairly light on genomics. Most of my day job is dealing with lab people and all that stuff. And given that it's my, bio, my background is originally bioinformatics, and this is a bioinformatics seminar series, what I wanted to leave you with today is at least two, um, two fields where the, the, U, the UMIs are useful and to leave you with maybe some ideas in terms of the research that you might want to pursue in the future uh, as, as pertains to this kind of uh, an application in general. Um, so for people who are not well versed in genomics, I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty, but this is basically genomics in its essence. Um, for those that don't know, this is an IgG plot, and uh, what you're looking at are uh, here dozens and dozens, but it could be millions of paired end reads mapped to a reference genome. And I'll, I'll get into the structure of uh, reads in a few minutes, but this is a pretty nice picture uh, that I managed to follow, follow on the internet showing uh, both all, all of the things that you would look for in an IgG plot. So you have your reads mapping to the reference genome. Here there's some gene annotation. Uh, in particular, an exon and a caspase with an intronic region. So you can very easily tell where your molecules are aligning to. And all of the little colored annotations denote some kind of mismatch between the reference genome and what you actually have in an individual read. So, for instance, this stack of dots here indicates that there's probably a mutation at this position. Um, and these colored uh, regions correspond to reads that, for some reason, map to the genome on one side, and then they, they, they basically go over a translocation to some other place in the genome. And what this plot is showing is that there's a dramatic region of continuous mismatches, meaning that that read doesn't belong here. Uh, so if you're working with any software, really what it's doing is analyzing base data like this and summarizing it into a list of mutations or a list of reads that translocate between different regions. Uh, but if you open the hood, this is what you would see. So where does this data come from? Uh, most of the time it comes from short read sequencers uh, of the Illumina family. Uh, this is a picture of um, OICR's NovaSeq. Uh, for those that don't know, um, this is pretty much the state-of-the-art machine available on the market in this space. Um, it's predominantly used for whole genome sequencing, but with tricks in the lab, you can use it for anything else. Um, and to give you an idea about the, the amount of data that's available for people from this day going forward, this is an evolution of three generations um, going from a high seq which produces about 500 gigabases per run and 6 billion reads and uh, running for almost a week to uh, the second last generation of high seq x which has about double the output um, in about half the time. And today's Nova seq produces uh, has two sides of the machine. Each side can produce three terabases worth of data, uh, corresponding to about 20 billion reads. You can do that in two days, which corresponds to about 30, 30x genomes per run, per side on the machine. If you do the math, that's about 5,000 genomes per year of one machine alone. And there's at least five or six of them in Canada that I know of right now. So there's going to be lots of data coming out of these things in the coming years. So this is a 30 second overview of what actually happens before it goes on to the machine. Um, so what you would start with is a template molecule here. Let's say this is DNA. The library construction begins with shearing or chopping up those fragments into, um, in, into smaller, uh, smaller bits that are about uh, 30 base pairs long. There's a little bit of enzymatic repair that I won't really go into, but you want to select some kind of distribution of sizes so that you can then do a little bit more uh, uh, tagging here. And really, NGS, what happens with NGS is there are these kind of adapters, they're called Y adapters, and they have different um, components of them. They're basically DNA, but they, they ligate and stick on both sides of the DNA insert. And without going into details, there are sequences on either end, they know here P5 and P7, that enable the sequencer to bind and read these molecules. And then within the backbone of these things, there are your molecular indices. The most familiar use of them is for sample uh, mixing in one lane of sequence. So the unit of sequencing um, is a lane, and you can run anywhere up to two samples, one sample, two samples, anywhere up to hundreds of samples. And each of the, the libraries that come from one sample mixed into one pool will have a separate molecular identifier. And those, those molecular identifiers are versatile. So this is just showing you uh, the same kind of construct. Uh, you can use UMIs for sample multiplexing, like I just explained. 
Um, one application that I'll go into is error correction and DNA based assay. So you can add more molecular, more unique DNA sequences within these adapters to crack individual molecules. And that's the essence of the device today. You can also use it to correct quantitative bias in RNA sequencing. Um, that, that gets generated because of the PCR steps during library prep. You can end up with different distributions of, uh, of your, uh, of your tech reads in your library than you would have in the original input RNA. Uh, and other applications, I'm not going to go into it, but, but you can do the same kind of correction and copy number tests. Um, you can use molecular identifiers for cell identification and single cell RNA sequencing assays, which I know that has been presented here before. And anything really where you need to tag and track molecules through assays. Um, just briefly, this is a typical production workflow that my group uh, thinks of when we're starting a project. Anywhere from planning the project to DNA extraction, library extraction, sequencing, final QC, and then data analysis. The parts you need to think about how you're going to use UMIs is, is at least three. Uh, so really, the use of UMIs has to be thought of up front uh, because it's a necessary part of building a library. Just a, kind of an FYI. Okay, one application is an error correction of DNA. So now if you if you build a library with UMIs, you can track track individual molecules. And this is um, this is useful because when you tag one input DNA molecule, let's say here, and you do PCR to amplify it, you end up with many, many daughter molecules. Here they all have a wild type sequence, so when you map it back to the genome, they're all referenced really. Um, another possibility is you tag a wild type molecule here, and you do PCR, and in one cycle you end up with a, a mutation or an error occurring in PCR, and then with, with amplification that gets propagated. So now you have a lot of daughter molecules with the same barcode here, because now you know that they originated from one original molecule, some of which are wild type and some of which have mutations. Um, and then what you really want to do is track uh, an original molecule, a parent molecule, with a true mutation with your barcode, and track it through PCR so that at the end, when you actually read data off the machine, you have uh, a pile of known mutations because they are there in all of the daughter molecules, and sometimes you get these errors, which then you can clean up. Um, the way you clean it up is quite simple, or at, at its essence, you basically just count uh, each position and how many alleles are in each position. For a particular family of barcodes, and unless unless this whole series of bases is unanimous, you know that there's an error, and you basically throw it away. So in this case, you have a unanimous series of, of mutations. You, you know that probabilistically um, they all came from one parent molecule. Uh, there's lots of papers out there that can do the math, uh, but you know that that's a true mutation. So what does that mean for the data? Um, this, these are two slides from a paper I published with, um, with a, a researcher from Sweden, uh, Anders Stolberg, uh, last year. We developed a met method to utilize UMIs in a PCR-based assay and do error correction with a, with, with, um, we, we, we were able to do error correction from very small amounts of input for particular amplifiers. And we wanted to do it to be able to detect mutations down to 1 in 10,000 um, or so, to detect um, mutations that are arising in very early stages of cancer. And um, what you can see is that these red dots here are the error rates of the raw reads without utilizing UMIs. And once you do the collapsing, like I explained a minute ago, you end up with lower per position um, error rates on what's called the consensus read. So, in, in, on the left here, you can see that we were going from like a mean of log 10 to the negative three and a half down to almost log 10 to the negative four and a half, uh, about an order of magnitude of error correction by use, using UMIs and the an assay. And the ultimate impact is shown here in a region of, uh, of a gene called APC. Um, this is just showing the error rates position by position. Light blue is based on raw data. And if you're just looking at raw data, this position here, you would you would be tempted to say that there's a mutation there at a at an abundance of three and a half percent. When we were doing this, we knew that this was a noisy base, and basically the the corrected data is the dark blue bars here. 
And we were able to completely eliminate all quote unquote mutated alleles in that position, basically saying that this is an artifact of sequencing or PCR. And these are the two mutations here that were present in our mixture at very low frequency and they weren't corrected away. So you can see that it really improves data if you can use UMIs. The other application that I wanted to share is um, using UMIs to do count correction in RNA sequencing. So I, I had mentioned that when you make a library, there's always a P PCR steps in there. And so imagine a situation where you have a cell with 10 transcripts, all equally abundant, and now you do PCR. You're not guaranteed to have 10% abundance of each transcript when you go to sequencing because PCR is stochastic and you're going to end up um, altering the ratios. So by changing the structure of the adapter, um, basically this group has moved the sample barcode to here and introduced a molecular barcode that, that corresponds to um, each tag RNA um, cDNA molecule. Uh, they basically allowed, allowed them to go through the same protocol. Um, and then in RNA-seq, you, you want to collapse counts. Uh, you want to collapse reads that align to the same position based on coordinate. <coughs> Without UMIs, these three reads, for example, would collapse to one read, and you would have a count of one for that transcript. But with UMIs, you would be able to identify that the top two reads come from one parent, and the bottom read comes from another parent molecule. So now when you do collapsing to try and correct for duplication rates, um, which is which is what arises from PCR, you, you correctly collapse these three reads into two reads, and you get a more accurate count of what your RNA molecules uh, look like. So this, 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 um, <laughs> these two figures from the paper, I hope, will, will leave you with a little bit of ideas for, um, for future work. The left panel shows that when you do this kind of collapsing um, with, uh, with, with only the coordinates, using only the coordinates, that means where the read maps to, you end up with um, one percentage of duplicate rates. And when you actually use the coordinates and the molecular indexes, um, you end up with a different level of duplication rates. We can go into this in questions if somebody wants, but um, the, the result from this is that when you use molecular indices, on average, you're ending up with a lower duplication rate, which means that you're throwing less data away, which means that there's more data available for experimental analysis. Um, this, this, also, this plot also shows that the duplication rate here, the deviation from x equals y, is greater for amplicon-based assays. Um, so uh, again, it's a little bit of a different application, but there's there's a lot that you can go into in terms of UMI research. For RNA-seq, the right-hand panel shows that um, when you're comparing the, uh, the full changes calculated between molecular index computed expression values and expression values that don't use molecular indexes, you end up with some kind of a deviation from, from zero, that would be uh, that there's a null effect. Um, and even though you see that there's a, a, a rise in, there's, there's basically differences between the full changes if you use, you, sorry, let me rephrase that. There's, you see, you see differences in the full, in the abundances of RNA molecules, um, that they're both overestimated and underestimated. Uh, without using UMIs. And the takeaway from this is that the distribution for the 15 cycle experiment, that's one, those are ones that use more cycles of PCR, the deviation is greater if you use more cycles of PCR. Um, the thing I want to leave you with, and the thing I don't really agree with UMIs for RNA-seq, is that you, if you're seeing that UMIs decrease the duplication rates, you should you should actually see a decrease in your expression values overall. Here you're actually seeing an increase half the time and a decrease half the time. So it's an open question in terms of what is it that UMIs are doing for transcriptomes. I think it's pretty clear what they're doing for mutations, but this is something an open question that I think um, anybody who's really interested in digging into this would uh, find interesting. So the summary that I just want to leave you with is that they, they do have utility through the whole next-gen sequencing process. Um, I mentioned that their major application that is proven to work is in mutation detection. Um, there are benefits for RNA-seq 
is still pretty unclear. Um, in my position, I get approached by a lot of company representatives who will say that UMIs for RNA seek are the next best thing and we should buy their products. Um, we always try to make our own decision out of OCR. Um, but the takeaway is that with the amount of data, there's lots of opportunities for bioinformatic tool development. And just to, to leave you with some ideas, there's, there's plenty of competing packages out there on GitHub that use UMIs for various types of applications, um, and everyone's trying to introduce something novel to the field. Uh, so I think that for at least some of you, there's, there's some interesting stuff to look into online. Thank you.